Welcome to Blackfriars. As usual, this video is designed as an aid to exploration. Log off the computer, pull up this video on your phone, and go for a walk. Each time I'm done talking about a building, I'll throw up a map to get you to the next one. Pause the video and take a stroll. Indeed, feel free to wander off script for a while. I'll still be there when you get to the next site, and there's always another side street to explore. Unlike other neighborhoods adjacent to downtown London, the area west of the Thames River was slow to develop. The neighborhood was low-lying and prone to flooding by the Thames River, a fact which would plague the area from its earliest days. The area's first development was not for residential purposes, but rather as market gardens to serve the growing city across the river. By the 1860s, however, the majority of the land in what would later become Blackfriars had been purchased by Charles Hutchinson and Samuel Peters, both of whom were determined to make a fortune subdividing the district into building plots. Hutchinson laid out a number of blocks in the southern end of the district, naming the area Kensington. Samuel Peters attempted to develop the north in a similar fashion. Neither man met with a great deal of success, as no solution had been found to the spring floods. But the combination of cheap land and close proximity to downtown led to a slow uptake in land purchases by working-class individuals seeking a place of their own. By 1874, the area had become sufficiently populous to incorporate as a municipality, and in recognition of Samuel Peters' efforts to develop the area, the new village was named the Village of Petersburg. The choice of name may not have been entirely voluntary. In any case, Samuel Peters appeared to have viewed the village as his own estate, and his interference in village affairs were sufficiently unwelcome that Petersburg renamed itself London West in 1881. At this point, the village was still impoverished, lightly developed, and at the mercy of the annual spring floods. A handful of minor industries had established themselves, including a brewery and an oil refinery, but none of them employed substantial numbers of people. Most catastrophically, the flood of 1883 was one of the worst in the city's history, with dozens of lives lost and many of the neighborhood's buildings being simply swept away by the river. Accordingly, in the late 1890s, a movement arose in London West to seek annexation to the city. The hope was that the city would, in return, pay for the erection of dikes and other flood control mechanisms which the village could not afford. While many Londoners opposed the annexation on financial grounds, London's mayor supported the movement, stressing that in the event of another truly disastrous flood in London West, the city would be morally obligated to offer aid anyway. Accordingly, annexation took place in 1897. The erection of substantial flood control measures followed shortly after annexation, and for the first time, the area was free of annual floods and began to develop into a solid, if still entirely working class, district of the city. But while the area's new flood control measures could deal with the typical annual spring floods, they were insufficient to cope with the worst floods. Another catastrophic flood struck the area in 1937. Unlike the 1883 flood, the 1937 flood didn't result in extensive loss of life, but it did result in extensive property damage. Ultimately, it also led to the construction of Fanshawe Dam north of the city, a structure which finally provided a permanent solution to flooding in the city. The area which used to be London West has now come to be known as Blackfriars, and remains an attractive area dominated by Victorian working men's cottages on short, tree-lined streets. Today's walk begins on the corner of Riverside and Wilson Streets. The baseball diamond on the northeast corner of Riverside and Wilson is Labatt Park, originally known as Tecumseh Park. The London Tecumsehs, the city's first professional baseball team, established themselves on this site in 1877 and the site has been used as a baseball diamond ever since, making it the oldest continuously used baseball stadium in the world. Tecumseh Park was renamed Labatt Park in 1936, after the Labatts renovated the park and donated it to the City of London. Walk eight relatively short blocks north on Wilson Avenue. The houses you're passing reflect the slow development of the neighborhood, with construction dates ranging from the 1860s to the 1980s, many of the buildings having replaced earlier houses destroyed in the 1883 and 1937 floods. Of particular note is the cottage at 81 Wilson, one of the oldest surviving houses in the neighborhood, built in 1867. The house was originally the home of Alexander Leslie, a market gardener who farmed much of the surrounding territory, producing vegetables, fruit, and fresh flowers for the city across the river. Stop at the intersection of Wilson and Blackfriars streets. Prior to the construction of a bridge over the Thames River on Richmond Street, most traffic into London from the north passed over Blackfriars Bridge. Accordingly, a small commercial strip developed in the mid-19th century clustered along Blackfriars Street west of the bridge. Blackfriars Street never developed into an important commercial district, however, 
and by the 20th century, the importance of the area as a commercial center had declined. Today, only a handful of commercial structures remain, including the building on the southwest corner of Blackfriars and Wilson, and the building at 60 Blackfriars. Turn left onto Blackfriars Street and walk two blocks west to Warren Cliff Road. Turn right, walking a block north on Warren Cliff to Empress Avenue. The school on the northeast corner of Warren Cliff and Empress was built in 1924 as the Empress Public School. The building replaced an earlier 19th century school of the same name located further east and was considered a model of modern school design at the time of its construction. The building was pressed into service as a refugee center during the 1937 flood with hundreds of families crowding into its gymnasium. Immediately to the north of Empress Avenue Public School is St. George's Anglican Church. The parish was founded in 1881, with the original church being built on land donated by Samuel Peters. By the end of the decade, the congregation had grown to the point where it needed a new structure, and in 1890 the present building, designed by the firm of Moore and Henry, was erected. The building's front facade is broken up into three sections, a division which is intended to hide the building's bulk and help it fit into its still largely rural environment. Walk three blocks north on Warren Cliff Road to Beaufort Street. If you don't want to walk further, you can stop here for a moment. We'll be doubling back through this intersection. If you're interested in visiting Samuel Peter's residence, however, walk three blocks further north to Grosvenor Lodge, an impressive residence set back behind forested grounds at 1017 Western Road. Grosvenor Lodge was built in 1853 as the home of Samuel Peters, one of London's most successful early businessmen and an important property developer in the area which would later become Blackfriars. By the 1850s, Peters had assembled a large quantity of land on the west side of the Thames River, and he decided to build a large new residence, commissurate with his rising social status. Seeking an architect for the new building, Peters wrote to his nephew, Samuel Peters Jr., a young man who had recently completed his architectural training in England. The residence constructed by the younger Peters is a Tudor masterpiece and an impressive first work for the man who would stay on to become London's first resident architect. The building is dominated by a pair of ornamental gables and entered through an ornate wooden entrance adorned with the initials SP and AP for Samuel and Ann Peters, respectively. The expansive wooden veranda is a later addition, but complements the house beautifully. Return south on Western Road to the intersection of Warrencliffe and Beaufort. Turn left, walking two blocks east on Beaufort Street to Gun Street. Just beyond Gun Street, on the north side of Beaufort, London's Waldorf School stands on the site of Sonby's Mill, Flour mills were an essential part of London's early development, cementing the city's role as the centre of the surrounding agricultural region. Farmers relied upon the mills to bring their wheat to market, and the mills in turn fed the growing urban population. There had been a mill on this site since 1848, but Sonby's mill was built in the 1860s and expanded several times thereafter. The building continued to be a flour mill until 1938, after which it served a variety of short-lived functions, most notably as a dance hall. Unfortunately, the mill was destroyed in a fire in the 1980s, the present structure replacing it shortly thereafter. Turn right, walking two blocks south on Gun Street to Oxford Street. Cross Oxford and continue south on the footpath beside the Thames River to Blackfriars Bridge. The dikes you're walking on were erected by the City of London as flood control measures designed to block the river's annual flooding from reaching the streets below you to your right. Blackfriars Bridge is one of the most iconic structures in London, a graceful arch connecting the Blackfriars neighbourhood to the downtown core to the east. The structure is the fourth or fifth on the site, records are unclear, but all of its predecessors were wooden bridges, easily washed away by the more dramatic floods that struck the bridge every few years. In 1875, the city determined not to repeat previous mistakes, opting for the then new technology of iron trusses. The bridge was considered something of a technological marvel, entirely produced at the factory of the Wrought Iron Bridge Company in Canton, Ohio shipped to London in pieces, and assembled on site. Many of the city's residents were concerned about the reliability of the new structure, so radically different from previous bridges in the city. And accordingly, the bridge's opening featured a demonstration of its stability, with teams of oxen pulling 40 tons of gravel back and forth across the bridge, first at a walk and then increasingly quickly. Today, far from being suspiciously new and different, Blackfriars Bridge is regarded as an important element of London's heritage one of the oldest iron bridges still in use in North America. Our walk ends here. To return to the beginning of the walk, continue walking south on the footpath along the Thames River to Riverside Drive. Alternately, you could cross over Blackfriars Bridge and explore the attractive residential streets east of the Thames River.